Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Baltimore Sun for our Newsmaker Forum, the first in our series this year with the candidates for governor in Maryland in 2014. Uh, our guest this evening is Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown, thank you for coming. We appreciate you uh, taking the time. Uh, and, um, you know, you might not want to mention this to your boss, but we did get uh, more interest in your event than when your boss was here a couple of years ago. No. So you <laughs> might want to keep that under your hat. Uh, for you in the audience, thank you so much for coming. Uh, how we'll proceed this evening is we'll give the Lieutenant Governor a couple of minutes to kick off the conversation, uh, and then I'll jump in with questions that you have submitted and that people have submitted in advance via email. Uh, if you uh, still have a question you'd like to submit, uh, we'll have runners uh, able to pick up the cards that you were given uh, coming in, and the, the questions will be relayed to me by the magic of Wi-Fi. Uh, and if you have your phone with you and you want to submit a, a question via Twitter, you can do that. Use the hashtag SunForum. So uh, with that, uh, Lieutenant Governor Brown, the floor is yours. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. First, let me thank you for hosting this evening. But I also want to thank uh, the Baltimore Sun for hosting uh, this uh, candidates forum uh, for gubernatorial candidates. And I know that you have in the past and will continue in the future to host similar forums to introduce uh, Marylanders, uh, to those of us who are seeking to serve uh, in uh, various capacities. It's an honor to be here uh, this evening. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, and I want to thank you not only for being here, but I want to thank you for the contributions that you make uh, to Maryland. Maryland's a great state, and it's because of you. Um, as an elected official, I have the opportunity to boast and talk about the great things that we're doing in Maryland, but I am very mindful uh, that what we do as a state and the things that we've achieved are uh, due in large part because of what you do uh, in our communities. I want to thank you. I want to thank my running mate, uh, Ken Allman, and his wife, Jackie, who are here this evening. Uh, Ken is the, if not the, certainly one of the best county executives in the history of the state of Maryland. The fantastic th things are doing in Howard County. You, you can call him the best. There is no county executive where you are right now. That's right. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Great things that they're doing in Howard County. His wife, Jackie, I also want to thank my wife, Carmen. Uh, I want to thank you for your, your love and your support. I, I couldn't serve the people of Maryland as a lieutenant governor uh, without your support. So I really, really appreciate it. I love you very much and, and uh, thank you um, very much. So um, it's exciting to be here. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last several years to travel uh, across this great state, our state, from Oakland to Ocean City, uh, Baltimore to Bethesda and points in between. And what I find is that no matter where you meet Marylanders, we want the same things for our families. We want opportunities made possible by good education. This is true wherever you go. We will all want to raise our families in a safe neighborhood, in a clean environment, access to quality, affordable medical care. And no matter where you meet Marylanders, what I find, and think about your own experience, we all want to live in a society that is just, with a justice system that is fair. And that's what we fight for every single day in Maryland. And that's why I love this state, because together we have achieved a lot. In the last several years, we have built the best in the nation public schools. But we all recognize that not every school is a blue ribbon school. Right? Together, we've driven crime down to the lowest levels in three decades. But we know that in some communities, crime continues to plague neighborhoods. We're one of only seven states that have come through the recession and maintained a AAA bond rating. That enables us to invest in roads and bridges and, and schools and in our communities. Uh, but we also know that for seven years, because of the recession, uh, we face budget deficits that we wrestle every year in Annapolis. This is a great state. We've expanded access to health care long before the Affordable Care Act to 400,000 Marylanders that didn't have access seven years ago. Yet, there are still communities that wrestle with health disparities, and we still are working very hard to ensure we implement all aspects of the Affordable Care Act. This is a great state, but like you, I know that it can be better, and it has to be better for more Marylanders. All Marylanders need to experience the greatness uh, that is Maryland, and that's why I'm running for governor, and that's why uh, for me, it's an honor to be here uh, with you this evening uh, to talk a little bit about my vision, uh, my values, and what we can do together to build a better Maryland for more Marylanders. Thanks for being here this evening. Yeah. 
Uh, well, we'll cut right to the chase. We've gotten a few questions about this. I'm sure you uh, may have anticipated this coming up. Uh, Jim Mason uh, wrote in to ask, why should the people, and uh, I'm not going to edit your questions too much, so if they sound harsh, that's <laughs> the way it is. Uh, Jim Mason asks, why should the people of Maryland have any faith or trust in your abilities to manage the affairs of the entire state when you have failed so miserably, his words, at the task you were assigned the Maryland Health Exchange, where is the apology you owe to the people of Maryland? So let me say that uh, everyone uh, who was involved uh, in setting up uh, the health benefits exchange uh, has a responsibility, and that includes me. Um, the governor, seven years ago, asked me to uh, spend a lot of my time and attention and to take a lead uh, in health reform in Maryland. Uh, and for the last seven years, we've achieved a lot. Um, just last week, the federal government approved an application for a Medicare waiver that is considered one of the most bold and innovative reforms in healthcare, where our hospitals will now have the tools to deliver better quality care at lower costs. We've done a lot. Uh, before the Affordable Care Act, we expanded health coverage to 400,000 Marylanders that didn't have access before, which I mentioned uh, in my uh, introduction. Um, just last year, we created this health enter enterprise zone program, and we designated in, in a community in West Baltimore a zone where we're gonna deliver more primary care resources to address health disparities. There are a lot of things we've done. Many, many of you remember when DeMonte Driver, a young boy, a 13-year-old boy in Prince George's County died because he didn't have access to oral hygiene services and preventative dental care, and he had an abscess and it went to his brain and it killed him. We're better than that in Maryland, and we responded to that. And now more and more kids, particularly living in low-income families, have access to dental care that they didn't have years ago. And that was all before the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, patient-centered medical homes. Every hospital in the state of Maryland is connected now on the health information highway. We're one of a few states that do that, so that providers have the right information at the right time to make the right diagnosis when you present in the, in the emergency department or when someone in your family is going into a hospital for care. We've made some tremendous strides. We've implemented the Affordable Care Act, and the governor has asked me to take the lead on that. And under the Affordable Care Act, now a woman is not going to be paying more for health insurance because she's a woman. Uh, you're going to be able to get affordable health care, even if a member of your family has a pre-existing condition where last year that wasn't the case. So we've done a lot to implement the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. A big component of that is the health benefits exchange, and that's the, that's the gist of the question, the health benefits exchange. Uh, this is the website uh, where we anticipate enrolling 170,000 Marylanders, uh, and included in that, or in addition to that, I should say, are another 92,000 Marylanders who are in the primary adult care and Medicaid that we're gonna now enroll to full Medicaid. So that's about 262. Today, we're at about 175,000. We've enrolled, enrolled roughly 74,500 through this health benefits exchange. It's been frustrating and disappointing because we haven't gotten every Marylander enrolled through the exchange that we set out to do. But since October 1st, when our launch didn't go as well as I think Marylanders expected, and certainly I did, uh, we've redoubled our effort. We've reorganized project leadership. We've launched a staff surge. Okay, we've refocused our vendors. There are some vendors who are no longer on the project, and we have new vendors who are. And because of that, we have seen improvements in the rate of enrollment uh, and the number of people who have been enrolled. I think what Marylanders are looking for, they're looking for leaders who aren't going to walk away from a difficult situation, who are going to set goals and demonstrate determination to achieve those goals, whether they're easy uh, or not. We're making progress, and today our focus is to do everything we can to create a very stable health benefits exchange so that we can enroll as many Marylanders until that open enrollment closes uh, in March. And we're making considerable progress, and we will uh, every day uh, between now and then. At a legislative hearing a couple of days mm -hmm. ago, <clears throat> you declined to apologize for the difficulties that people have experienced because of the website. Uh, why? Uh, do you, would you care to apologize for the difficulties people well, experienced? Well, yeah, and this was the answer that I offered um, uh, at, the, at the hearing. Um, you know, I'm deeply uh, disappointed uh, and frustrated uh, when on October 1st, um, I saw that the, the exchange didn't launch. When we set up the exchange, we set it up uh, with an exchange board and a staff. 
Uh, many of us were receiving reports on the progress of the website development. Um, perhaps a week before the launch, uh, I learned for the very first time that we'll have some volume difficulties, uh, maybe some small glitches with unique cases like a large family, or maybe if a Native American family was enrolling, a unique demographic group. Um, and it was clear to me after the launch uh, that the reports that I had been receiving uh, were not complete uh, and accurate. Uh, and I was, I was frustrated uh, and disappointed. But what frustrated me the most was knowing that we didn't deliver uh, for the people of Maryland. And as I traveled around the state and met with Marylanders who approached me about the launch, said, hey, it's not working for Marylanders. What they said was, what we want is continue making the progress that you're making. Continue to roll up your sleeves and get it done. But also, I had Marylanders that came up to me and said, thank you. Certainly not for the launch, but for the work that we've done in Maryland to implement the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. You know, that single mother who said, hey, you know what? Thank you very much because last year I was paying $197 a month for health premium. Today I'm paying only 97. Today I can go to my doctor and get a mammogram okay, without paying a copay, but that wasn't possible last year. So there are Marylanders that also expect, expect gratitude. I think what Marylanders expect are leaders who are going to continue to work and get the job done, even if it's a difficult, even if you encounter difficulties along the way, and that's what Marylanders want. And that's what they expect. I'm deeply disappointed and frustrated in what Marylanders want. And I hear it every day. I hear it every day. Tell us that you're going to continue working at it each and every day. Enroll as many Marylanders as we can before open enrollment closes. That's what Marylanders are, ask Marylanders are asking me for. Not, not for an apology. No, I haven't had a single Marylander that's asking me. <clears throat> Other than Alan Kittleman. Yeah, that's right. So at least one Marylander. Yeah, uh, staying on, on health care, uh, we've got a question from the audience about the uh, Medicare waiver, uh, asking why this is going to work in Maryland when no other states are doing anything like this. And first, if you could briefly explain for the people who are not familiar with what is admittedly a very complicated subject, uh, what this is and why you think uh, it can work in Maryland. So the Medicare waiver, well, I'm going to try not to deliver a lecture because this is complicated stuff. Let me start by saying, because of the Medicare waiver, which was established in Maryland in the 1970s, and we can thank Barbara Mikulski, who then, as a congresswoman, was championing that effort. Um, if you were to look at the increase in the costs uh, of delivering health care in hospitals in this country, it looks like this. But because of, this is a graph, right? So it's going up this way. The cost from 19, I'm 1973, that's today. This is what the cost has looked like. But in Maryland, it looks like this. Okay, and what I'm trying to represent with my two arms is that the increase in the cost of delivering care in Maryland hospitals has been lower uh, than uh, anywhere else around the state because of this Medicare waiver. What the Medicare waiver does, it gives us the ability to, to charge a higher fees, okay, reimbursement fees under Medicare. Now, remember, the federal government pays Medicare reimbursement. Federal government said, you can let your hospitals charge the federal government more for Medicare, okay? But in doing so, your commercial, your Care First, your Kaisers, and your other carriers, they'll pay the same rate. That's why we call it, that's why we call it the all-payer system. Everyone pays the same amount. Medicare pays a little bit more, and the private carriers are paying a little bit less. That's why the carriers like it. And the reason why the hospitals like it is because it gives them more predictability as we set the rates. We're the only state, and this is what you meant when you said the only state. We're the only state that sets reimbursement rates for hospitals. So we set them to provide them just a small margin to keep their doors open. That margin fluctuates. The hospitals like it because they can count on it. They can rely on it for planning. So the Medicare waiver that we just renewed it kind of works like this. Instead of hospitals getting paid because of the volume of people coming through their emergency departments, because of what used to be an incentive to fill hospital beds, because it was a fee for service, so there was kind of an incentive for hospitals to bring people in and fill the beds. But well, we're saying no more. We're going to put you on a global payment. You're only going to get a certain amount every year, no matter what your volume is. 
So now you see the hospitals have an incentive to keep the volume low. Because what we've said is if you can keep that volume, in, volume low, we'll share the savings with you. So hospitals say, hey, that's a good deal. Let's have more care and services, wellness and prevention in the communities to keep hospitals out. Let me give you an example. Out in Western Maryland, one hospital that's in this global payment structure, they realized that they had a lot of kids that were coming to the emergency department with asthma. That's pretty expensive to be treated for asthma in an emergency department. It's not the, it's not the most efficient or effective way to deliver care for an, an asthma patient. What you'd rather do is prevent that person, in this case children, from having these asthmatic attacks. So what did the hospital do? They said, you know what? We can spend a little bit of money and go into the local schools where we can do prevention and, tr and, 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 and counseling and how to identify signs of asthma, et cetera. It's much less expensive than having the child present in the emergency department. They're going to keep their costs down. And there are examples of that all over the state. That's possible, and it's going to be more widespread and prevalent in the state because we renewed this Medicare waiver. Maryland leads the way in a number of ways, right? And this is one of the ways where we're leading. Uh, uh, last week when the uh, waiver was approved, it was characterized as the most innovative and the boldest reform uh, that uh, we have seen in the country when it comes uh, to improving the quality of care and reducing the cost of that care in our hospitals. So we're pretty excited about it. What are the risks? Uh, the risks would be if, for example, as we go to global payments, Okay, assumptions about what a hospital uh, will, um, will incur uh, if those assumptions are wrong. Uh, but the reason why we are minimizing that risk, because again, we're the only state that regulates hospital rates, so we have more data on the experience, the costs, and the revenues in hospitals than in any state. But there is a risk, but we've got the data to help mitigate that risk. Another risk would be if let's say a hospital was under a global payment system and their incentive is to keep people down, but let's say for some reason there was a, a rapid expansion in the population in that community because it's an attractive community. So naturally with an increased population, you would see more hospital um, visits, not necessarily because they're not um, providing quality care to keep people out, but simply because you have an increase in population. So that's a potential risk as well. Well, there's also that you've promised Medicare that you're going to keep costs cost increases below the rate of growth in the state's economy. You're going to save Medicare $330 million over the next five years. If that doesn't happen, the waiver goes away. That's right. And the way it happens is you have your global payment, and you, which incentivizes hospitals to push care out into the community and not in the hospital. There are going to be cases that have to go to the hospital, right? We all know that. Uh, surgery, sometimes elective, sometimes uh, uh, un, uh, unscheduled, emergency departments. It's always going to happen. But if we can push more and more care out into the community, uh, then that's where we have our best chance uh, of uh, reducing the cost of care. Eighty percent of the cost of delivering care in this country is for 20 percent of the patient population, and that's in managing chronic illnesses and diseases. You know, hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes, asthma, and many of those conditions are preventable, or at least you can reduce uh, the uh, frequency uh, of uh, the emergency uh, surrounding those uh, chronic illnesses and diseases. So if we're managing them better in the community through prevention, wellness and prevention, and less so in our emergency departments, we will be able to drive down the cost of delivering care in our hospitals. All right, switching gears now on to education. A uh, question from the audience. What are your thoughts on the value of standardized testing, uh, particularly the MSAs this year? The context, for those who are not familiar, is the state is switching over to a new set of uh, education standards known as the Common Core. The curriculums are changing in every school district in the state, yet the new tests to assess this new material have not been fully developed. So the state is giving the old tests, uh, but teaching the new material. I'll tell you what, when my son Jonathan comes home every day, and he's preparing for a test, I always make sure that he's opening up the right book so he's studying the right material <laughs> for the, te the subject that's being taught in school. Uh, there's a debate as to whether or not we should administer the MSAs this year in Maryland. And you know what, and I don't know where you stand, I don't think we should. I don't think we should. <clears throat>
You know, what I believe is that we've got this new common core, right, new standards as part of education reform. And I also know that we're developing a curriculum, okay, that aligns with those standards. And as we develop that curriculum, I would like to see that in counties throughout the state, the local boards working with teachers, classroom teachers and educators are developing the curriculum that is most effective for those students. And when we do that, we should then have an assessment that accurately evaluates the delivery of that education. And if today we're in transition and we have not yet established the assessment for that new curriculum, then I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of sense to use an outdated uh, test. Uh, so uh, I'm not a fan of it. Are you, you, you're a little, you're gasping for air. Are you okay down there? No, no, you can't ask questions. I can yeah, only ask we'll, questions. We'll Andy and I can ask questions. We'll allow it. Uh, so I think, I think that we ought to. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat what she says. Yeah, so uh, if I might just repeat for the... If I might just uh, summarize a little bit in case people didn't hear, uh, the, the lady in the front was saying that a lot of teachers are having difficulty with this transition because it is a whole new curriculum. They're not used to developing uh, all this. You know, the school districts are obviously developing these curricula, but the teachers have to implement it day by day. It's a very difficult time for teachers, I think. Um, if I might uh, piggyback a little bit on what you said, uh, mm -hmm. superintendent, the state superintendent Lillian Lowry was in talking to the editorial board here a couple of days ago. We, of course, spent a lot of time talking about this issue. She disagrees with you. Uh, among other reasons, she says, look, the federal government says you got to give standardized tests every year. If we don't, they're going to whack us on funding. They're going to take away race to the top money. Who knows what they're going to do? Yeah, okay, so certainly I have a lot of confidence in uh, Dr. Lowry. Uh, it's my understanding that states can request a waiver. I'm not suggesting that we just decide without a waiver from the federal government that we don't administer a test. I do not want to see Maryland State forfeit uh, federal dollars. We, we were very successful uh, in being awarded uh, several hundred millions of dollars in race to the top funds. They're going to very good use throughout the, the state. Uh, but there is an opportunity to uh, request a waiver, and I certainly would, would, would support that. And you're right. Um, educators need the, they need the training, they need the resources, and they need the time to develop curriculum and also to prepare lesson plans. Uh, as I travel around the state, as I'm in schools and classrooms, that's one of the biggest complaints that I hear um, from uh, teachers. Uh, you know, complaints may be a little strong, but certainly a concern. If we want our teachers to deliver the very best in education to our students, um, think about your own work and what you do in your, in your you know, walk of life. I know for me, um, I, I need time to prepare, and I would expect, and I think we do, uh, of our teachers. So they need time. And that's one of the things that we need to support our uh, educators in. Uh, time to develop lesson plans, uh, time to prepare, prepare for the day, uh, and time to uh, develop the, the curriculum. And that curriculum will always evolve and improve it from one year to the next as you, as you are um, getting the feedback from the delivering of that instruction. So I have confidence in Dr. Lowry, uh, but I also think that where there is a process uh, to receive a waiver uh, from testing, uh, then we ought to seek it. If we don't seek it, or if it's not approved, then we would need to administer uh, the uh, MSAs this year. All right. Uh, sticking on education, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, can you share your position on the role of charter schools in the state? And if I'll add one more element to that, do you think the state's charter school is law is adequate or does it need to be changed in any way? Um, I think charter school, schools add um, an additional element, um, capacity, um, innovative in many cases, capabilities of delivering education. I've had an opportunity to visit a number here in uh, Baltimore City. Uh, that are doing very good work um, in, in the classrooms. Uh, so I support uh, charter schools. Um, uh, but I also think that, um, uh, like anything, uh, we need to continue looking at 
uh, the laws that govern and set up and regulate, whether it's charter schools or anything else, uh, and where we can make those improvements without the s sacrificing the quality uh, of delivering that education, then I think we should. Uh, should we improve our charter school laws? Absolutely. Um, and in, I think in what ways in particular? Um, one is, for example, we don't um, we don't support the facilities uh, that um, in which the charter school operates, um, and that the uh, entity that establishes the charter school uh, is responsible for acquiring and maintaining the facility. Um, I think if we do that, uh, and we really do support charter schools, you run the risk uh, that students in charter schools, year after year, uh, will be educated uh, in increasingly failing and deteriorating, could be, potentially, um, facilities. Look, we just made a $1.1 billion uh, investment in Baltimore City Schools. Uh, that's because students in Baltimore City are being educated in some of the most uh, dilapidated, deteriorating uh, facilities, some of the oldest building, school um, buildings uh, in the state. Um, so whether you're in a charter school or a non-charter public school, uh, you should be educated uh, in a technology-ready modern classroom. Uh, so I think that's probably one area where we could look at uh, improving the uh, charter law, the charter uh, program. Yep. Uh, if I might follow up on that, the county executives from Baltimore County, Prince George's County, and Montgomery County were in Annapolis. Uh, you missed it because you were testifying on health care at the time. <laughs> but they had a news conference uh, in which they were not in so many words, but more or less asking for a deal similar to what Baltimore got in terms of a long-term specific funding commitment from the state for school construction so that they could uh, do you know, the same sort of program the city is doing. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, let me kind of set the table on that one. Um, over the last seven years, we have made record investments uh, in school construction. Um, in the first year uh, of our administration, uh, we invested $400 million in, in school construction, schools around the state. Uh, and we've averaged about $340 million a year to get our kids out of those old buildings that we were, I was just talking about. Some are in these, you know, what were considered temporary trailers, but they seem to be these permanent fixtures on too many school campuses around the state. Uh, so we've averaged about $340 million. Uh, this year, uh, we are in our capital budget, including $283 million. So it's not our lowest year. Uh, it's below our average, and it certainly isn't our highest year. Um, I supported what we did for Baltimore City became, because it certainly gave, it gave certainty and predictability uh, to a revenue source for capital investment so that the city could go to the bond market and leverage it for the $1.1 billion. I think we ought to look at the same arrangement. Now, whether or not we can achieve the same scale or volume uh, is going to be a challenge this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we can develop the same arrangement, a predictable, steady stream, uh, then I think we ought to be uh, looking at that because that right. gives counties the opportunity to go to the bond market uh, and leverage it for, in the case of Baltimore City, $1.1 billion. Uh, Montgomery County is probably one of the fastest growing um, uh, school systems by enrollment today. Um, and they have needs just like Baltimore City does and Prince George's County and, and I'm sure Howard County as well. I mean, this is an attractive state. Our population is growing. People are moving. Uh, to Maryland and families are staying in Maryland. So we have, we have increasing enrollment around the state. We want to make sure that every child um, has access to a world-class education, and that includes an education that happens uh, in a technology-ready modern classroom. Yeah. Uh, we've had several people uh, from the audience and on Twitter asking variations of questions about Baltimore crime. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, ba Baltimore's gotten off to a very violent start so far in 2014, uh, and violent crime was up last year as well. Um, they're interested in uh, what plans you have uh, to reduce crime, particularly in the city, but in the rest of the state as well, and to keep uh, residents safe from guns. Keep who? Residents safe oh, from residents. guns. Oh, residents, okay. Yeah. Um, Everyone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, l let, me, let me start by saying I can't think of any responsibility uh, that is uh, more important uh, to government than ensuring uh, the safety uh, throughout our communities. It's a function that is uniquely government, uniquely public sector, um, safe neighborhoods. Um, I think that in order to ensure safety in our communities, you have to have a robust partnership 
uh, between every level of government, uh, state government working with uh, local government. And that partnership doesn't mean that the state dictates uh, what uh, local efforts ought to be in establishing safe neighborhoods. I believe in uh, community-based policing based on local law enforcement strategies. I look forward uh, to working uh, with uh, the mayor uh, of Baltimore as we take on the challenges of improving safety uh, in the city. I think there are a number of things that the state needs to commit to. That's ensuring that through a partnership that the men and women on the streets have the resources they need, the training, uh, the equipment, uh, the information uh, to focus on the most uh, violent, uh, the most harmful criminal activity in our communities. I think that's an important responsibility shared with the state. There are things that the state police can do in partnership uh, with uh, the city as well. Uh, we know that uh, a very large percentage of some of the most violent crimes in Baltimore City, and certainly this is true for uh, the homicides in Baltimore, are drug related. Uh, and there are things that we can do. We can use the Maryland State Police uh, to interdict drug trafficking on our state uh, and federal highways. We can provide information through our fusion center to make sure that local law enforcement has the best information uh, as we're collecting DNA to make sure that we're matching up DNAs, particularly with known offenders. Other things that we can do, we've done a pretty good job, I think, uh, and that's why we are seeing the statewide downward trend in violent crime, uh, is our violence prevention initiative. You know, there used to be a time where we'd have this many people on parole and probation that we're supervising, and we're supervising them about this deep. And what we've done more recently is we focused on the most violent offenders who are under our supervision that have returned to our community, and we're supervising them, them this deep. And as a result, we have been able to reduce uh, violent crime uh, in uh, some communities, not all, uh, throughout the state. So I think a more effective use of our violent prevention uh, initiative. But it's a partnership. It's making sure that uh, resources are available, uh, technology, training, equipment, and information to the men and women on the streets. Um, we also look, need to invest more, uh, fund more um, our diversion programs. I think we need to look at um, uh, drug use more as a public health issue and not just a public safety issue. So diversionary programs, increasing investments in substance uh, abuse treat, uh, uh, treatment uh, and counseling uh, so that we can uh, increase, um, or I should say decrease, uh, the uh, number of drug-related crimes uh, that exist uh, in Baltimore. So those are some of my thoughts on how we can work in better partnership uh, with the city uh, to reduce crime uh, in our city. All right. Uh, we've also had several questions uh, about your position on whether the state should build a new jail in Baltimore City, new mm -hmm. Baltimore City Detention Center. It's a project that would cost half a billion dollars, more or less. When you think about the Baltimore City Detention Center, that's one facility uh, in a correctional system. Uh, and the correctional system is part of our criminal justice system. Um, and as we're looking at the Baltimore uh, city Detention Center, uh, we ought to be focused on a number of goals. If the overarching goal is to improve safety in our neighborhoods and the Baltimore Detention Center is part of that system, uh, then what are we doing to improve uh, safety in our neighborhoods? I think first and foremost, as we look at the Detention Center, we've got to improve the security uh, in the facility. Security for our correction officers uh, and security for our inmates. Uh, that's why I support um, increasing our efforts and using technology uh, as we reduce the flow of contraband, particularly cell phones, in and out of that facility. We have better technology to keep the devices out, and we're about to deploy better technology that if that device makes it in there, will render it about as useful as a paperweight. We need to make sure that we're improving the manner in which we recruit and retain our correctional officers. We need to hold them responsible and accountable for their conduct. And when they're involved in misconduct, we should not allow them to sort of hide behind a bill of rights. Correctional officers, like all law enforcement officers, have certain rights. It's a difficult job. And sometimes things happen. And when we're accusing them of, doing, of wrongdoing, there are certain protections that they should be afforded. But no one should ever be able to hide behind a set of rights that prevents us from investigating and better understanding 
what it is that we need to do to improve so security. So are, are there specific changes you would seek in the Correctional Officers Bill of Rights? Yeah, in fact, this, this year in the General Assembly, and I, and I support it, uh, we are going to amend the, um, the uh, Correctional Officers Bill of Rights so that we can administer polygraphs. Um, and that uh, if a correctional officer uh, is under investigation, um, we can administer a polygraph uh, to determine whether or not um, you know, they uh, were involved in misconduct or not. That would be one of the, of the, of the, of the several uh, techniques that, that we could use. So I, I do support that. Look, if we're retaining and recruiting the best and the brightest, um, I think that's going to uh, enable us up front uh, to avoid uh, some of the misconduct. But the other thing that we need to do is improve the supervision. You know, we need to improve the supervision. So just as if we have to recruit and retain the best correctional officers, we have to <coughs> recruit and retain uh, the best supervisory personnel uh, as well, giving them the, the training uh, to do the, the, the monitor and the oversight uh, in the facility. Um, we've got to make sure they have the best training, uh, the best equipment. You know, you, you may remember, <coughs> You may remember that seven years ago, we closed uh, the House of Corrections uh, in Jessup. It's probably one of the most dangerous correctional facilities and one of the oldest in the country. It wasn't safe for the inmates, and it certainly wasn't safe for the correctional officers, and we closed it. Um, the Baltimore City, De uh, City Detention Center is an old facility. Um, now, it's a difficult issue. Do you close down a city detention center and invest millions of dollars in a new jail? Or do you invest that money uh, in other uh, facilities that may reduce the volume of people coming into the detention center, like in more rec centers, right? more community centers, more schools? Uh, so these are the difficult decisions that, that, uh, that, that we have to make. Right, that, that you hope to make. So where, how would you make, where do you come down on that decision? I think we need to modernize uh, the detention center. I think we do need to look at a replacement uh, and in making the consideration whether to move to a completely new facility or not, we're gonna have to balance that against the interest. When we have a limited capital budget, I think it ought to be a priority uh, and I would, I would take a very close uh, look at it. Okay. Uh, jumping back to uh, piggybacking off something you said a minute ago, we've got a number of people who are asking uh, similar variations of a question that Chance Carter of Baltimore sent in via email. He says, considering that your opponent, Dele Delegate Heather Mazier and Senate President Mike Miller, have come out in favor of legalizing marijuana in Maryland, what is your position on marijuana? Do you feel that legalization or decriminalization is the right fit for Maryland? Good. You know, there was a, a story in today's Baltimore Sun. Oh, Baltimore Sun, here we are. Uh, and if you read that story, and you may remember the, the mayor commented, uh, on the issue, um, and, but the way that the story is read and suggests that there's a little bit of confusion. So let me just take a minute first to lay out what we're talking about. There's on the one hand, there's medical marijuana, which I support, and we passed last year, where marijuana could be prescribed by a physician in a clinical setting for medicinal purposes, right? Uh, and I support that. On the other hand, you have legalization. Some refer to it as taxation and regulation. That's what we see right now in Colorado and Washington. The great thing about this country, you've got 50 states doing a variety of different things, taking different approaches to the challenges that we face. I think we have a real opportunity as a state and as a nation to look at the legalization of marijuana in Colorado and Washington to see whether it works or not. And if it does work, what are the pitfalls and what are the things that if we go in that direction, we can avoid. But in the middle is decriminalization. And by decriminalization, what we're talking about is just like we don't, we don't accept running red lights and you get a civil citation and a fine to go with it. If you jaywalk, we don't, that's unacceptable as well, and you'll get a civil fine and a citation to go with that. So the question is, should we be treating small possession of small amounts of marijuana in such a way that instead of criminalizing it, it's more of a civil fine and penalty? I support that. And I'll tell you why I support it. Remember what I, my answer to the last question. 
If we're going to reduce crime in our neighborhoods, we want law enforcement to focus on that criminal activity that creates the greatest harm in our communities. And I don't believe that dedicating resources to prosecuting and arresting and prosecuting small amounts of marijuana is the kind of strategies that are going to make our neighborhoods safer. So I would support the decriminalization of marijuana. But let me also say this. Coupled with that, let me, this is important. Coupled with that is there has to be stepped up education in our schools with our young people. Because we certainly don't want to send the message that we're encouraging and condone that. No, no, just like with alcohol. You know, we, we have education in our schools. We have parents who are responsibly telling their, their children, don't consume alcohol as an underage child. That's what parents should be doing. Right? And the same thing would be true in our schools, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and in our homes, educating our children about the risks associated with using marijuana. So we're not saying to our kids, it's okay. We're not saying to anyone it's okay. And there's a civil, civil penalty. But let me tell you this, and I'll end on this. When we arrest people for marijuana, studies have shown that marijuana use, the rate of use, the percentage of people who smoke marijuana or consume marijuana, the rates are about the same in white communities and in black communities. But when you look at the arrests for the use of marijuana, black communities, white communities. You may, and, be, you may be lowballing that a little. Yeah, I may be lowballing. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. And then what ends up happening, and then here's what happens. Some people say, well, no, you know, marijuana use leads to criminal activity. The use of it, the possession of small quantities. But you know what creates a greater problem? When that young African-American man now can't get a job because he's got an arrest record. Can't, can't get housing because on the housing application they ask, were you ever arrested? He's marking, yes, yes, yes. And you, got, you have a disproportionately high number of African American men saying, yes, 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 yes. I was arrested for small possession, for possession of small amounts of marijuana. Um, that's a problem. That's a problem. So in this balancing act, right, we want safe neighborhoods. We want the police to focus on those activities, that conduct that is most harmful to society. I don't, I don't condone the use, and I, and I speak to my kids about that every day of marijuana, okay? But I don't think that they should be treated as criminals. Um. <clears throat> if you were governor and the Senate passed the same de decriminalization bill they passed last year, would you sign it? Andy, you know what? I really don't know the details of that bill. I really don't. I think, I think people have a pretty good understanding where I stand on decriminalization. But I, I, if I said yes, I don't know all the details of the bill. Uh, I, I don't, you know. Okay, so. fair enough. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions about budget government spending. Um, uh, so sort of representative of them from the audience. How would you address the state's uh, budget deficit, the one that would be projected to continue? Uh, if you were so fortunate as to be elected, uh, and what would you do to control government spending? Sure. So the budget that we submitted yesterday, we project that we will eliminate the structural deficit uh, in uh, two years. Um, and again, let me set the table. Why do we have a structural deficit? You know, some would say it's mismanagement of government. Um, I reject that, and I want to explain for a minute why. Back in 1997, you got to go that far back, Governor Glenn Denning um, provided a 10% cut to the personal income tax. In fact, Marylanders weren't clamoring for that tax cut, but Governor Glenn Denning with the General Assembly cut the personal income tax by 10%. Around that same time, I think a few years later, not too far after that, uh, we passed the Thornton Bridge to Excellence um, in education funding, which was considered around the country as a model program for equitably funding education in our schools. And we're proud of that. And it's because of that increased funding 
that we do have the number one schools in the nation. Not every school is a blue ribbon school. and We still have a lot of work to do. But that's why we've seen the progress that we had seen around the state. So what happened several years ago is you had a reduction in revenues and an increase in education expense. Education today accounts for 48% of the state budget. 48 cents of every dollar that we spend goes into education. Most of that is in K through 12. Some of that is in higher education. So this was happening a few years ago. When we came into office back in 2007, we did some unpopular things. You'll remember, we raised revenues, and we were on track to eliminate that structural deficit. And then what happened? We came headwind with the Great Recession. The deepest recession, and I see a few people in here that might be a little bit older than me, but I don't think anybody was living during the Depression. Don't put your hand down. You're not old enough to be in the, during the Depression years. Deepest recession, economic downturn since the Depression, uh, and uh, causing a cyclical um, deficit. Um, and it's been a slow recovery. Uh, we are on, on track to eliminate that structural deficit. A number of things we've done. A uh, number of things we've done. We've reformed the state's pension uh, system. We now ask state employees to make a greater contribution on the front end. And for new employees, they don't get the same benefits on, on the back end. The vesting time to vest used to be five years, now it's 10 years. So we've reformed uh, our pension system. We held pay increases uh, in state government, the cost of living increases, the COLA increases, the SEP increase. Um, we had furlough days. We asked state government employees to make considerable sacrifices uh, to weather uh, this uh, difficult time. And again, we raised some revenues. We tried to take a balanced approach, and that's the way that we do it in Maryland. Um, during the last seven years, every budget that we have submitted to the General Assembly, and this is my pledge as governor, has been in what they call spending affordability. We never have, and as governor, I never will, send a budget, a bloated budget, to the legislature to, to, to please some and then let the legislature do the hard work of cutting my budget. I won't do that. I will always send a balanced budget within spending affordability. And if we're in an economic downturn, then we'll do what we've done in, in the past. It'll be a balanced approach so that we can continue to provide quality education, <coughs> safe neighborhoods, a clean environment, and invest in infrastructure in our, in our state. That's what Marylanders deserve, that's what they demand, and we can do that uh, with a balanced budget. Um, so a somewhat related question from someone in the audience uh, related to taxes. Uh, how can Maryland business stay competitive with Virginia when they have a lower corporate tax rate? Did you say taxes? Yeah. The good news is I don't see the need in the foreseeable future to raise any taxes or fees in the state of Maryland. Applause line, anybody? <laughs> say, I, think, our, I think some people might like you to go a little farther than yeah. that. So our economy is recovering, albeit slowly. We are projecting to eliminate a structural deficit. Uh, I believe that we're going to be able to deliver, uh, we're going to be able to deliver quality schools, safe neighborhoods, uh, a, a health safety net um, uh, that male owners uh, deserve uh, and they demand uh, within uh, existing uh, revenues uh, and resources. Um, uh, so uh, somewhat related to that, one of the um, biggest proposals you've made so far is the expansion of pre-K uh, to four-year-olds in the state. How would you pay for that? There's a question from the audience. Sure. Um, a few months ago, I, Ken and I, uh, we rolled out our plan uh, for uh, expanding uh, pre-K, establishing universal pre-K in Maryland to all four-year-olds uh, by 2018, by the end of 2018. Uh, this year, we are beginning um, and taking our first step towards that with a $4.3 million investment in the current budget. At full build-out, half-day kindergarten for all Maryland four-year-olds, it'll cost the state about $141 million a year. My proposal is to take that from the revenues generated by expanded gaming in Maryland. Got the Horseshoe Casino going up. I know it was a contentious issue, expanding gaming. Percentage of that is going to education. In this last, uh, last legislative session, I supported the effort to ensure that part of that education spending goes to pre-K 
education. Look, there's a difference in a child who starts kindergarten with a 3,000 word vocabulary or an 8,000 word vocabulary. We see that difference when they show up to school in kindergarten. We can start measuring that difference by fourth grade. And by 12th grade, that difference can be so great that the career options for that 3,000 word starter is nothing like what it is for that 8,000 word starter. How do we eliminate that? How do we ensure that all of our kids are ready to learn by kindergarten? That's pre-K education. That's an investment that's worth making. We've got the revenue source identified, expanded gaming. We've got a plan that we've laid out on how to implement this using a combination of public facilities, because a lot of these programs are being offered. Matter of fact, uh, close to 95%, if not more, of Baltimore City uh, school students are in pre-K. Four-year-olds are in pre-K. Most of them in public school setting. There are private providers around the state that are providing pre-K. We need to work with them. We need to work with them. And whatever we do, we need to make sure that it's quality pre-K. So there will be standards to ensure that that pre-K educator at the front of that classroom is delivering the very best education. So that's our plan. We're beginning to phase it in this year. Our goal is to make sure that every child has a running start when they, when they begin. I might follow up on that for a second. The, <clears throat> the money from the casinos is already dedicated to education. Uh, it's already been baked into the state's budget projections over the foreseeable future. Uh, so are you proposing that some of the money that would have gone to K-12 to be diverted into pre-K, or are you saying that you should backfill the money that would have otherwise gone to K-12 to come from somewhere else? Are, we, what are, I'm you, saying, are you taking from one to give to the other, or right. are you finding some other money somewhere else? What I'm saying is that within the spectrum right, of public education funding in the state of Maryland, we are going to include an additional $141 million by 2018 so we can include pre-K education. So is and the K revenues- So is K-12 going to have 140 million less than it otherwise would no, have? No, we are going to- we So are going where is to, 140 million coming from? From the revenues projected from a game. Which are already going to K-12 to education. So. And, that's why, and that's why last year we amended the law to ensure that that can go for pre-K funding as well. Okay. Um, you, don't uh, want, you don't want it to go to pre-K? No, no, I'm just oh, okay. saying- just I, I'm, just, sure. I'm yeah. just a fan of arithmetic. Now let me, let me say this as well. When that, that's half day. The ultimate goal, and we've laid out a plan, is to go to full day. Uh, in Baltimore City, you have full day pre-K. Uh, there are communities around the state that don't have half day, some students, uh, and uh, don't have full day. Um, in that initial expansion, right now there are about 26,000 four-year-olds that are in pre-K programs funded publicly, some in public schools, some by private providers. Uh, as we go to 2018, we're going to expand that by about another 26,000 half day, the goal is by 2022 to go to universal full day pre-K. Now when we get from 2018 to 2022, it does get more difficult. So the work that we need to do for the next, during this next five years is to study and develop that plan for a more traditional sharing arrangement with the counties and the city of Baltimore to fund that more expansive um, a full day. But right now, we're, we're working towards a uh, half day uh, by 2018. All right, we'll let that go for now. Yep. Uh, so we're, we're running out of time here. So I, I'm gonna end, uh, I apologize to everybody who submitted questions that we didn't get to. There are a lot of good things here that unfortunately we're gonna have to uh, leave on the table. But there are, I think, two good questions to end on. They are uh, both from the audience. One is, uh, if you're elected governor, in what ways will your administration differ from Governor O'Malley's administration? Please be specific. And uh, the other one is, why Ken Ullman? So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Jackie I, I submitted that wife, one. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, pretend he's not here. Let me start with that first question. Um, I don't think the question is, how am I going to be different? I think the question is, what, what's next? Martin O'Malley and I are different people, right? 30 years ago, when I graduated college, I accepted a commission as an officer in the United States Army. You know, I spent five years flying helicopters in Germany with some of the most patriotic men and women from all four corners of this country. 
You know, some of us flew helicopters and drove trucks. We were me me mechanics and medics and cooks and clerks. We love this country, and every so often we let ourselves believe we were part of a noble cause, for the defenders of freedom and democracy, and that we were proud of that. Uh, my background is considerably different than Martin O'Malley's. Um, I'm a first-generation American. You know, my parents were born, my mother in Switzerland, my father raised in poverty in Kingston, Jamaica. I'm, a, I'm about a generation and a half away from poverty. My father came to this country when he was a little bit older than, than my son is today. He wrote a letter to his mother and he said, Mom, who was already in this country, he said, Mom, he saw a lot of poverty in the, in the community he grew up in. He says, Mom, he says, I want to come to America. I want to heal people. I want to be a doctor. She didn't have a whole lot of money. She worked for wealthy people. She was a domestic. Maybe you either read the book or saw the movie, The Help. That was what my grandmother did. She saved her money. My father was the first in our family to get a college education. And then he spent his entire life giving back. As a doctor, he served, saw patients, treated people in some of the poorest neighbors and hospitals near where I grew up in New York. And when I grew up, I knew I wanted to be just like my father. Didn't go to medical school. I went to law school because I wanted to serve. I think the question is what's next, not how are we different. We're different people. Uh, and what's next is building on the successes that we've achieved together over the last seven years. So specifically, what do I mean? We built the best in the nation public schools, but not every school is a blue ribbon school. That's why I'm moving forward on pre-K education. And that's why in November or early December, I rolled out a plan for career technology education. Remember when we were younger, they called it VoTech in schools around the state. We can provide students with that world-class comprehensive education and prepare those who aren't going to college right after high school for a career where they can get a job, where they can support a family. I visit a school in Queen Anne's, Queen Anne High School. They've got 10 CTE pathways for their students. And it's very important for those who aren't going on to college. It's in automotive. You can talk about a global economy. You are not going to send your car to China to have it repaired. There will always be jobs for auto uh, mechanics. They have CNA, Certified Nurse Assistant Programs. A lot of them go on to be RNs. Ten tracks. Been to Western Maryland, Allegheny High School. Outstanding program. Howard County, a phenomenal CTE program. We don't have enough of those programs. So what's next? You may want to say what's different, but what's next is building on our successes so that we can build a better Maryland for more Marylanders. That's the question, what's next? How are we gonna build on our successes so that we have not only a better Maryland, but a better Maryland for more Marylanders? I can't do it alone, I know that, and that's why I'm so excited that I picked up a partner in Ken Allman. Ken is an experienced and accomplished public servant. See, Ken and I are a member of a profession, the profession of public servants. We happen to be in a smaller cohort of elected public servants. And as I speak to our peers, Ken's at the top of his game. Ken's been an effective county executive, and that's why they compete for the best public schools in the state. I always say compete because I think, well, who, who's got the best? Howard County's got some really good schools, and Ken's been a big leader. A few months ago, Howard County Public Library is ranked number one in, in the country. Put that into context, there are 70,000 li library systems in the country. Howard County is number one. Howard County has a strong local economy. It's created more jobs, uh, and their, their, their rate of job growth has exceeded every county uh, in the state. He's got an extraordinary relationship with the private sector, with partners in the public sector. He gets results. He's got a lot of energy. He's going to make, I think, the best lieutenant governor in the history of our state. That's why I picked uh, Ken, and also Carmen and I knew that Jackie was coming along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank, thank you. We'll thank conclude you. for the evening. I hope everyone will be back. We'll have uh, Harford County Executive David Craig here on February 5th, the first Republican candidate we'll have in uh, with the other candidates to be announced shortly thereafter. So Great. thank you, Lieutenant thank Governor. Thank you.